So speaker number one is uh, our, our invited guest from uh, Australia, and it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Cameron Murray, and he is a, an economist specializing in property and housing systems, natural resource management, and corruption. Uh, he regularly communicates economic ideas to his one-man think tank, Fresh Economic Thinking, which you can find just with those three words. If you're looking for it, I, I highly recommend it. If you want to understand the economics of housing markets and why everyone claims to want affordable housing, but no one wants cheap housing, then his new book, The Great Housing Hijack, is for you. So with that, I'll invite you, Cameron, to come up and take it away. This thing is at your service. All right, thanks everyone. Yep, please head over to my website, put your email in, and that's how you'll find out about the book, The Great Housing Hijack, that's coming out uh, next month. Thanks, Patrick, for inviting me here today to speak, and thanks to the other panellists, Mark, Tom, and Alan. Uh, I'm really looking forward to the discussion, what we might learn from each other. Thank you to the audience and everyone following at home. I guess I should start by sharing a little bit about who I am um, before I tackle the question posed today. And uh, so I'm an economist from Brisbane, Australia. I've worked for residential and industrial property developers. I've worked in state government regulatory agencies. Uh, I studied a PhD on the economics of grey corruption. And if you want to read about that, I wrote a book called Rigged, How Networks of Powerful Mates Rip Off Everyday Australians. Uh, that summarises some of that work. And from 2019 to 2023, I was a researcher at the University of Sydney looking at housing supply economics. Now I run Fresh Economic Thinking, uh, the one-man think tank and consulting business. So I think I'm well placed to comment on the question we're here to discuss. Is local democracy in the way of affordable housing? Now, I'm no expert on Vancouver, the intricacies of its planning history, or its fights about preservation and heritage. But I have three things that I want to contribute that I think can help us consider the question more completely. First, an international and historical context. Second, a deep understanding of the economics at the heart of the question. And third, a view on the politics of cheap housing. Let me start with one of my favourite quotes. It could have been written by me on Saturday when I arrived in Vancouver. Let me quote. The number of large houses just finished and others building is truly surprising. Nevertheless, everyone complains of the high rents and difficulty in procuring a house. But of course, that was Charles Darwin in 1836 on his first diary entry on his first day arriving in Sydney on the HMS Beagle. Before he commented on any of the animals, the humans he studied first, and this is what they said, the population of Sydney at the time was less than 20,000. And of course, there were no planning rules or local democracy to speak of. Housing issues are not new. In 1910, the New South Wales government commissioned University of Sydney academic Robert F. Irvine to investigate the problem of rising housing rents. But it didn't go away. In 1919, the Federal Interstate Commission conducted the Piddington Inquiry in Australia to the same problem. Still didn't go away. In 1939, the New South Wales government repeated the same inquiry again. Key public officials summarised the pre-war housing situation as follows, and let me read this quote. Cheap mean houses were built all around and between the factories, with no legislative restrictions to set even modest standards of space and light or even humanitarian considerations of health and privacy, row upon row of workers' dwellings were jammed into every street. Land values rose with the high industrial potential, and this was reflected in the added rents until this spiral of values reached a stage when one family could not afford one terrace home. These homes were then subdivided to cram in more people, and so began the overcrowding that exists until this day. End quote. It's a comment from 1947, commenting on the... 20s and 30s. We can, we can also look to the future, though, of online game worlds. 
where property systems are replicated digitally, housing crises are often the result. Game designer Lars Doucet wrote this. Digital real estate is not actually a new phenomenon, and history consistently shows that when digital land sufficiently resembles the economic properties of physical land, we see digital land speculation, digital housing crises, and even full-blown digital recessions. Could it be that the same economic forces are at play here in Vancouver today, rather than local democracy being the problem? The market today is doing what it always does with price and construction cycles that are disruptive at different points in time, but nonetheless don't swing too far from a general price and rental equilibrium. You might not believe me, but if we look at the total housing cost for renters in Canada as a share of income since 2001, we see flat lines. It doesn't matter if we look at average housing cost to income or median. And in fact, I've done this same exercise for cities around the world, and we see very flat lines for many decades of rent-to-income ratios, with very little cyclical variation between. So why don't we look a little bit more deeply at the economic forces oh, at play in property markets. Our concerns about housing rents and prices are not about houses or, or buildings. They're about spaces to put them in. Builders can't just build housing. Builders must work for property owners, and it's the economic incentive of property owners that matters for this question. The argument that local democracy keeps up dwelling prices is at its core a competition argument about how own owners of property will react to zoning changes. If more land is zoned for housing, so the argument goes, then more property owners will decide to build more quickly, undercutting each other on price to do so. Here's the puzzle. Most cities, most of the time, have huge numbers of properties with development potential that can be legally and feasibly developed, yet hardly any of them are. In my hometown of Brisbane, there are a million existing homes, almost an identical number to in Vancouver. And at least a million new homes can be built within our current zoning laws, and probably much more because of the flexibility of our planning system. And tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands, of different people own these developable sites. So how would changing the rules to allow 5, 000, 5 million, 6 million homes to fit without any review process, how does that change the competitive dynamic that has so far led to just 20,000 new dwellings per year? What about the glamour strip of the Gold Coast? If you go to Sydney, travel 1,000 kilometres north, that's where you go. It's a beautiful place. Many areas of the Gold Coast have had no density limits for decades and very light touch regulations. After all, their mayor of the city since 2012 has been Tom Tate, a property developer and investor. So you'd expect cheap rents and prices. But asking rents are up 73% nominally in the last three years and house prices have doubled. They are experiencing one of those rapid adjustment periods that all property markets go through. And here's the puzzle. Amongst all those high-rises, that tall one you can see there is Australia's tallest building, Q1 Tower, that was completed in 2005, conceived of in the 1990s. But that's it at the top of the store, the top of the image there, closer up. All around it are huge, undeveloped, vacant sites with no density limits, where the tallest building in the country was feasible to build more than two decades ago. If we go a few blocks north, that's the light rail station uh, at the top of the page there, We've got three multi-hectare sites that have been vacant since the 90s. In fact, when, when a dwelling application was put on that site there that says Adrenaline Park, which is now demolished, um, the local uh, councillor said, a lot of these blocks have been empty for a long period of time and been screaming to be activated. They're screaming to get housing built, they're zoning for it, yet there's little action for decades. An easy way to make sense of these facts is to understand that property isn't an asset like a company share. If we want to understand competition in property, we need to understand that for a property owner, the choice to build homes is a portfolio decision or an asset swap. Take an undeveloped property asset like one of those sites that's already making a return in terms of its increase in value. Take a cash asset 
that you would use to build the building that's already making a return in the form of interest and swap those two assets to get a housing asset. Building homes faster means giving up those returns and suppressing the price of your next sale of your next dwelling. What these effects create is a built-in speed limit on how fast new housing production will happen, which closely tracks cycles in home buying. And I call that speed limit the absorption rate equilibrium. To make sure the choice to build makes a better return than not building, these asset swaps are typically build to order. Ensure the buyers exist before you make the asset trade. If you don't, then you wait. A property owner's choice to build or not is not about whether the revenue from building homes is higher than the input costs. If it was, there'd be a million new homes in Brisbane and dozens of new high-rises at the Gold Coast. Changing the number of feasible development sites doesn't necessarily change this speed limit, though of course it can change the composition of which sites go in which sequence as intended and what gets built where. So it's an error, I think, to assume that the production decision of housing is the same as the textbook model of the fixed sunk cost short run supply shock. Houses are not like agriculture. You don't get good seasons and a sudden surplus of houses and have to sell them cheap before the next season's crop arrives. This is why wherever a property system is replicated, even in online worlds, we get all the similar problems. Furthermore, because, trading prop because you can trade property assets, especially developable property sites, it's always the most patient people that end up owning those sites. Okay? They can outbid the impatient ones who want to build more quickly and flood the market. In 2005, I was a graduate working at FKP, a publicly traded housing developer in Australia. And one of my colleagues there uh, prepared a bid to buy a former army barracks site to build an industrial subdivision. His bid was $17 million. He thought, that's the most I can pay. The winning bid was $40 million. I can tell you why, because the next year I went to work for the winning bidder, which was a privately held company that had previously built a new concept of like a mixed industrial office park. And he wanted to do it again on a larger scale. The trouble is the council didn't want offices there because they already had areas zoned for office and retail. My new boss told me, I don't care if it takes 30 years to get an approval. I'm in no hurry. He was very patient and that's why he won the bid. You can actually buy an industrial lot there today in 2024, 20 years later, though the office stage is still waiting. Here are some examples of here are some examples of this property economics in action. I looked at the rate at which property owners of Australia's master plan communities, their greenfield subdivisions with over 3,000 housing lots each that have been going for more than 10 years, I looked at how fast they sold and built their projects. This is one of those projects in Victoria, Atherstone, outside of Melbourne with 4,300 approved lots back around 2010 at the end of the last property cycle. When prices weren't rising, if you see on the, left, uh, on the left grass is the monthly average lot price per square metre, you can see prices are basically flat. And on the right, that's the monthly rate of sales. And they're selling about four or five a month from 2012 to 2015. Then, when all the buyers show up, they start selling at 40, 60, and the peak year is 80 per month. Then the buyers slow down, they start selling at four or five a month again. And notice what they don't do is keep selling to push the price back down to what the costs of those lots are. They keep the price up. Some of these projects have been going since the 1990s. And the same logic applies in rental markets. My favourite example is on the Gold Coast again. This front project here is called the Smith Collective. It might be relatable because that was the Commonwealth Games Athletes Village in 2018. There's 1,251 dwellings, all built, all empty uh, as of June 2018. It's a now private build-to-rent project. And in 2021, I asked the managers of that project, how's build-to-rent going? Like, do people like renting off these corporate landlords? The manager told me, and I'll quote, the precinct has been on a staged release strategy so as not to flood the rental market 
and is now 70% occupied. Three years later, they left hundreds and hundreds of already built dwellings from 2018 vacant because it made them more money. That's the beach built in speed limit in action. I think the fundamental economics here are fairly undeniable, and there's a few more elements to this story. Um, the price of homes is really determined uh, by the value of the housing asset, not the, the supply, and how, how desirable one location is over another. And that's consistent with the 2016 paper from, from Tom here that I'll quote, and, and hopefully we get, we get some response here soon. His conclusion in 2016... Economists sometimes assume that strictly regulated housing markets near mountains and oceans, who, who knows where that could be, are expensive to build because they're costly to build, not because they're nice places with productive firms and workers. US data shows this convenient assumption to be false. And even if you could massively increase the amount of dwellings with zoning, there's a conclusion from Tom's 2008 paper. This is from an, uh, an earlier version, but I'll still be interested in the, a discussion. We conclude that individual jurisdictions are unlikely to in increase affordability by encouraging more supply and recent house price increases most plausibly reflect demand changes. Well, I concur. I think we agree on the economics. And part of the reason here is some economics I've missed, which is about the spatial equilibrium, that if prices really did start falling in Vancouver, then lots more people would move here until such time as the prices were bid up so that there was no value in moving here. So you've always got to watch out for that. Now, all of this is perfectly consistent with what many properties developers said at yet another Australian housing inquiry <laughs> in 2020 when responding to the question of whether upzoning could reduce prices 20%, reversing the gains of the past year. I'll quote the response. No, straight out, it's not going to create that much of a difference. The chairman of the inquiry, stunned, said, it's funny you say that because after four weeks, weeks of hearings, that's pretty much all we've heard. So when they're under oath talking to the politicians at the inquiry, they say upzoning is not going to change the price. How interesting. So that's the economics. The last thing I said I'd say, the politics. The unfortunate reality is cheap housing in the form of low rents and prices is politically undesirable at all levels. Politicians as a group must pretend to want cheap housing without achieving it. <laughs> so, look, yeah, it's the same everywhere. You're not alone. We're with you. We're, we're, we're warm Australia is with cold Australia. <laughs> warm Canada, down under. You know we call you cold Australia, right? Um, it's so culturally similar. So let's entertain a hypothetical world where we get rid of local democracy, we upzone and massively reduce prices through fierce competition and supply. Well, housing market participants would immediately expect this. Prices would collapse today to immediately incorporate that information of lower future rents and prices. What do we do when prices collapse? I don't know what happened here, but in 2008 in the financial crisis, all Australian governments took immediate action to stimulate house prices with bailing out mortgage holders, low interest rates, stimulus, stimulus and subsidies to home buying because the last thing they want is lower house prices. And we did it all again during COVID in 2020. We threw money at housing to keep prices up because when it really happens that prices fall, we don't like it. Nobody wants prices to fall until they do until they become property owners, of course, and then they want them to rise, which is another element of the political question with 67% of Canadians being homeowners, which is the same rate as Australia. It's a pretty real and important political constituency if you're in the business of trying to manipulate the price of housing. Let's not forget, politicians themselves at all levels are mostly homeowners and landlords. So let me share some of the Australian numbers. <coughs> Almost all parliamentarians are property owners. This is the latest chart from last week, the top. There's 151 upper, uh, lower house MPs. 146 of them have one or more properties. 103 have two or more. 63 have more than two. In the, lower in the upper house, sorry, the 76 of them, 69 own a property, 47 own two or more. In fact, the average is around two and a half dwellings per politician. 
if the, each dwelling's worth a million dollars on average, which is slightly above Australia's average, but these are above average people, let's be honest, we're looking at around 600 million of property just between this group. We've got 660 elected state politicians, 5,600 councillors, and if they have similar property values, we're looking about $13 billion of residential real estate between our elective representatives, even ignoring the very important family and friends in their portfolios as well. Do we really think this group is going to pass laws to wipe billions from their own balance sheets? A quick look at the Canadian political disclosures shows that around 41% of British Columbia's elected parliamentarians are landlords, so I think a similar analysis applies here. How much time? Yeah, that's perfect. So I said I'd do three things. Offer an international and historical context. I think I did that, and I even threw in the online gaming for you. That's a freebie. Steak, steak knives are on me. A deep look at the economics at the heart of the question, and three, a view on the politics of cheap housing. Um, I've got a whole page here, but I'm going to skip it and just leave you uh, with a, one anecdote and a conclusion. One is, I come from a city where planning and zoning is essentially designed to get things built, and yet we still have the same property prices, rental prices, property cycles and concerns. In fact, when I looked at the Canadian real estate websites, I thought everything seemed quite reasonable by comparison. Okay, so I think every city I've been to always says, we're the worst at this, we have the most expensive houses, we're the worst at doing building trains, we always, all of our projects go over time. No, we're all the same, we're in this together, okay? So that's something to leave you with, but, um, what else am I even going to say here? It's okay to upzone. It's okay to simplify planning. Oops, I'll try that one. It's okay to protect heritage areas and it's okay to allow missing middle housing in some areas and not in others. It's okay to have high density clusters. We can shape our cities in any way we want, but like shaping clay, it needs a little bit of pressure in some areas to get what we want. So I'm not here to tell you how to zone or what to do. I actually think Democracy is a useful way to work out how to zone and what to do. But I want to leave you with this. In the coming years or decades, when nothing seems to change in the housing market despite repeated zoning changes, I hope you remember this talk. Or even better, I hope you glance over at your bookshelf, see my book, The Great Housing Hijack, that, because when you put your email in on my website, you find out about it, and you'll remember this talk. So, I wait any questions about some details. I'm expecting some about Auckland. Thanks very much. I'll pass it over.